a disclosed conflict of interest, you would want to see if the person is being 100% truthful about the extent and the nature of that relationship. They may say, uh, I have a college roommate, my old college roommate uh, is involved with this company, uh, but I have nothing really to do with it. Well, do you have nothing to do with it? Are you staying within the lanes that are required for you uh, to keep that potential conflict only a potential and not crossing over and exerting influence based on factors other than price or quality of the services that that person is providing. From there, you would want to remediate that particular situation. So you'd want to establish firewalls to keep that person uh, away from that particular conflict. And those are not that difficult to do under most circumstances. Uh, many of us in various management positions over time have had to recuse ourselves from things having to do with an individual who we might have a relationship with or a business that uh, there might be some tie to. Uh, and that's a very simple thing to do if it is completely ab above board and disclosed. The clearest consequence of that is uh, some degree of collusion and typically uh, kickback schemes with vendors, gratuity schemes, uh, all have an element of conflict of interest in them. Uh, by definition, if someone is receiving a kickback, a percentage of sales, or some kind of benefit uh, for giving a, letting a contract or favoring a particular contractor, there's usually more to it than that. There's usually a relationship that underlied that whole problem, and that that's why these conflicts need to be effectively managed. If it ends up uh, being a conflict of interest that involves any kind of government regulated business, uh, you're going to have the government regulators or the Department of Justice come in and they're going to criticize the company for failing to prevent this. And if they knew about it, if it was disclosed and they failed to take any kind of action, uh, it's not going to go over well for the company in terms of the, uh, the fines and penalties. I think the reporting hotline, if it's an anonymous reporting hotline uh, that's marketed correctly, and I'll get to that in a moment, um, can be very effective uh, because often um, employees just have an inkling that something is off. Something's wrong with this uh, manager's relationship or this person's relationship with this company. Uh, they seem a little too close. They seem to know each other. Uh, they seem to do things together on weekends. And individuals who have that casual observation don't know enough to put their finger on it. But if you can get them to call that reporting hotline, um, you can get a lead that can create an investigation that might be able to reveal something. Uh, I think the best way to market that is often not to call it a hotline. It's to call it a helpline. It's to encourage employees that if you have a question or even a concern, it's not for you to be 100% sure. But if you have a concern, call the helpline and shift the responsibility from you in your mind to us as a company and our leadership, and we'll look into it. We'll determine whether this is a problem or not a problem. Uh, and often that's all people have to go on, uh, just a, a hunch. And in a lot of companies where the hotline is viewed as the 411, it's pulling the, the fire alarm, and I'll only call the hotline if it's something very serious, employees then are not going to call about the hunch. They're only going to call when they know something is wrong. And you've weeded out unnecessarily an entire caseload of potential issues that you really want to be able to look at.